So, uh, good afternoon. Um, I often find when I come to conferences that I'm one of the few people, uh, or come, come to library conferences and, in fact, many museum conferences, that I'm one of the few people who comes to talk about science. Um, often, oftentimes, uh, science doesn't get quite so much of a look at it in at the museum tech conferences I go to. Um, so I'm very pleased that now I've got a library project that I can come to a library, <laughs> library conference uh, and sneak a bit of science in there. So, the Biodiversity Heritage Library. Um, at, at its heart, the Biodiversity Heritage Library is an aggregator that uh, aims to provide uh, full text access to scanned literature. Um, in these couple of images, uh, you can see uh, rare books uh, opened up um, and out of the compactuses uh, in Museum Victoria's library. Um, and rare books are certainly very well represented in the Biodiversity Heritage Library. Um, but we've also got, there's also many, many journals, many serial titles. Um, and the journals were originally scanned to the extent that copyright law would allow, uh, but now increasingly uh, publishers and institutions, many publishers and institutions uh, that we're now going back to are agreeing to sign up to provide access to in copyright literature as well. And particularly the institutions uh, who are uh, self-publishing um, self serials, so for example, our museum publishes its memoirs, uh, the Australian Museum publishes its records, a number of, uh, a number of institutional publishers are, quite, are more than happy to have uh, their in-copyright runs. Sometimes you get restrictions, maybe uh, institutions will say, okay, we're still making money out of the last two years' worth of journal titles, for example, uh, so you, can't you can have up to two years ago. Um, but uh, many institutions now are saying, uh, saying, yes, please take them and put them up. So the site has been running for a number of years now. Uh, it was originally started as a consortium of 15 uh, libraries based in museums and herbaria around the United States and in the UK. Um, these figures uh, down, the, down the bottom um, of 88 thousand titles. Uh, that's the overall corpus of the whole uh, Biodiversity Heritage Library. So over 45 million pages are now in the Biodiversity Heritage Library. And how did they get there? Um, so getting, getting all those pages uh, has been done pretty much in uh, the way that Brewster was describing this morning, um, getting, a, getting a scanner and scanning page by page. At Museum Victoria, we've been really, uh, really grateful to and very lucky to have a team of five volunteers who do pretty much all of the scanning for us. They come in three days a week and they do the scanning, they do the post-processing uh, and all the upload. Uh, at our site, our librarians make the choices about what's going to be scanned. The volunteers then do the scanning and we've got a project team of three people working part-time to keep things running. So with, a, with that volunteer contribution, uh, we've contributed over a few years 295, um, uh, 295 items from 74 titles. So there's a number of journals that we've contributed in, a, in, a part, in there and nearly 70,000 pages. Um, given that that's being done by volunteers, I think that's a pretty impressive effort. Different uh, organisations around, uh, around the world are doing their scanning in different ways. So uh, the Smithsonian, who's one of the very big contributors and one of the original founders of BHL, for example, has a what they call cottage industry scanning like this uh, actually on site. But then they also wrap up whole trolley loads of books and send them out to one of the Internet Archive scanning centres to be done in bulk. So. Most of the public access to the Biodiversity Heritage Library is through a central website, um, whose name I didn't actually put on the site, but it's biodiversitylibrary.org. Um, and there's also a couple of language specific nodes that I'll mention um, briefly later in the talk. Um, it was very important to us that uh, the site be free and open. Uh, the organising principle of BHL is that it's public access and um, uh, no registration would be required, no signing up, uh, and that the con access to the content would be completely free. One of the principles of uh, originally starting the project was um, to think about how not everybody can physically access the great libraries of the world, and even the little libraries of the world. 
Uh, they might be in a country that uh, maybe doesn't have great libraries themselves that in that country. They may not be able to travel. Um, they might be in a rural or remote area and not able to access physically access a library. Or for science researchers, they might simply just be out in the field and want to get those book, want to get their uh, the literature that they need, or uh, well, these days on a tablet or laptop PC. So. One of the very important things that we've been doing with BHL is trying to develop a financially stable future so that it can remain free. And that's been a critical part of the activities that have been undertaken by the Secretariat for BHL, which is based um, over in the US at the Smithsonian. So I'd also like to um, give a, a hat tip to a very important partner and friend to the BHL. Um, except that Brewster's left the room and so he doesn't get to hear it himself, um, which is the Internet Archive. And the Internet Archive acts as a really vital conduit for literature being uploaded into BHL. So many, although not all, the volumes in the BHL can also be found in the collection in the Internet Archive. What we've done is uh, developed a methodology where the scanning is done uh, wherever the scanning's done, right around, uh, in libraries around the world. Uh, a, custom-built piece of software called Macaw was developed at the Smithsonian. That's used to then uh, paginate uh, your scanned images and then uh, the content goes up into the internet, internet archive. Um, the advantage of the Internet Archive is that they offer services such as the OCR service, uh, which, which means that individual providers don't have to do that. All we have to do is upload the image files and then the Internet Archive does the rest for us in terms of making uh, EPUB versions, Kindle versions and doing the OCR. So this particular screen shows a book that was uploaded by Museum Victoria, which is called um, A Naturalist's Miscellany. And here it is in BHL. One of the things that we really uh, value about BHL and being able to put, um, put these old volumes in um, is really uh, opening up the access as well to the images. And I'll also talk about that a little bit later. The Internet Archive has also helped the BHL by supplying uh, the machinery for digitisation uh, in the form of scribe machines. Um, and uh, again, Brewster mentioned that um, earlier, mentioned those machines earlier. So in, the, in this, uh, these couple of images on the left-hand side, uh, you can see one of the very first scribe machines that was provided by the Internet Archive uh, to the Smithsonian Library um, back in, all the way back in 2007. Uh, the other image on the right shows Robert Miller from the Internet Archive uh, talking to colleagues in Kenya. And BHL in Africa is one of the most recent recipients of scanning rigs. What the scanning rigs, what the, the scribe scanning uh, rigs do, uh, which is a little different to, the, to just setting up a, a scanning or digitisation rig of your own, is that it has the software and the, um, the software inbuilt to upload straight into the internet archive so you don't have to do so much post-processing. Uh, once the pages are cropped and de-skewed and numbered, then uh, all you do literally is press a button and off they go, which makes it very convenient for getting that content, passing that content through. So as I said, I was going to put a little bit of science into this. Um, and the Biodiversity Heritage Library was originally started, the original aim of the project was to help support scientists and particularly taxonomists to do their work of naming species. And so one of the features of BHL is seen over here. Uh, where we run a series of algorithms across each page to look for scientific names and to look for, or at least look for, strings of text that look like scientific names. Those scientific names are then cross-linked where we can back, there's a tiny little uh, logo there, which is the Encyclopedia of Life logo. The Encyclopedia of Life, which uh, has a, uh, a, catch, a catch line of um, a web page for every species, uh, if we can find a species name in the Encyclopedia of Life and link it back into the literature, then that gives uh, two-way links um, from, the, from the literature into the Encyclopedia of Life and back again. Taxonomy is a discipline that's um, somewhat unusual in the sciences um, in that heritage literature is just as important as current literature. If you're in the business of naming a species or looking at a particular group of animals, and, animals or plants, and the animal that you're looking at that you think is a new species is very similar to something that was described back in the 1890s, well, then it's 
off to the 1890s literature you have to go to go and make that, make that comparison. So uh, the heritage literature is actually very important to taxonomists. However, as I've just recently discovered, heritage literature is, um, this is sort of an off, often a little tangent, uh, heritage literature is uh, important for other disciplines as well. So it's not only taxonomy, taxonomy that benefits from access to the literature. Uh, this paper was published in, uh, the, in um, ARXIV, the Physics Archive, um, and talks about how, uh, how pa heritage papers from in the, in the physics discipline is now being referenced. And that what they're finding is that um, the more papers come online, the more the old literature is being referenced. And so it's actually coming back into use simply through being made more available. So that was just a little bit of a that was a little bit of a an aside. So we have, as I mentioned, other important partnerships. I've already talked about a little bit about the Encyclopedia of Life. The other uh, project, which is um, uh, sitting below the Encyclopedia of Life, is called Biostore. Now, Biostore is a project that's run by an individual academic, a guy called Rod Page, at the University of Glasgow. And what Biostore does is it tries, it tries to address the uh, mismatch between what scientists, the level of cataloguing that the scientists require and the level of cataloguing that's available within, the library, within a library cataloguing system. So a researcher looking for references um, that might be relevant to the work they're doing is looking at other scientific papers in scientific journals and are seeing the actual papers. What tends to happen in libraries um, is that you will get that journal. Yes, yes, we've got the Journal of Crustacean Biology. It's on the shelves over there. Off you go. Uh, rather, rather than the, the researcher being able to really provide assistance to the researcher who doesn't just want to know that they've, you've got the Journal of Crustacean Biology. They want volume 32 and page 60. Um, and so the level of library cataloguing, uh, there was a mismatch between those. What Rod's done is taken bibliographies published in scientific papers and has tried to then go back and re articleize if you like, uh, or create tables of contents off digitised versions of journals. And so he's managed to put the, put the, put the journals back together again and then has fed that back into, uh, back where, where he's managed to find, an, find articles, put that back into the BHL so that now researchers can actually uh, um, search on article titles rather than just on journal volumes. One interesting thing that he notes is that sometimes the, um, sometimes you, can, you get a really good idea about how popular a paper has been, or more to the point, you get a, get a good idea of how unpopular various papers have been. If he can't find a single bibliographic reference to that to a particular paper, it stays blank in Biostore. And so there are certainly gaps within Biostore where nobody's, nobody's referenced that paper and so it just sort of doesn't appear. Um, I'll also just quickly mention the, the Digital Public Library, Library of America um, and the BHL has been another one of the uh, founding partners of DPLA and contributes to that, um, uh, uh, that service since it's been live in two since it went live in 2013. I sort of alluded to the fact that BHL is a global uh, collaboration um, and although it was started originally in the US and the UK with a consortium of, of libraries in those countries, it's since expanded really through very active um, activities by the, um, particularly the US team uh, to get other people on board. So BHL Europe now encompasses um, most of continent, continental Europe and is run um, through, uh, through the uh, library in the Czech Republic. BHL Egypt is run through the, through the Bibliotheca Alexandrina. Uh, there's a node in, in China. Um, Cielo down in um, South America is run out of, uh, is, a, is a BHL node run through, a th run out of Brazil. Uh, BHL Africa is run out of South Africa, but there's most more recently, uh, Kenya has also uh, started to contribute digitised volumes. And there's an Australian node as well, um, which I'm the uh, project lead for. And most recently, the most recent uh, member to join is in Singapore. So it really is a global initiative, even though um, 
those are very big logos on a very um, kind of manufactured map of the world, so there's still many places that aren't adequately represented. One of the great things about being part of a global collaboration is the, the opportunity to meet with BHL partners. And I think one of the one, being able to actually meet in fa face to face at, at uh, conferences and at meetings really is one of the, the reasons for the success of BHL. The partners have learnt have certainly learnt an awful lot about each other, about different processes, and we've all always been very impressed at how um, how how much enthusiasm and passion uh, different partners bring. So on the left hand side, uh, you can see that we from our fezzes might give you a hint that we met in Morocco. Uh, and earlier this year, we met uh, all together in Australia. Next year, we'll be heading off to Brazil. As I mentioned, uh, some of the global nodes have particular language specific aims, challenges and issues. So BHL China is concentrating on digitising texts in Mandarin and providing, uh, and so they have a, a, their own website uh, which provides, which, which is in Mandarin and provides um, tools for researchers in Mandarin. One of their particular challenges was um, doing OCR in Mandarin and getting back OCR results in Mandarin. Um, and there's had to be quite a lot of tweaking of the uh, OCR engine to actually allow it to cope with um, Mandarin language texts. In Egypt, um, as I said, Bibli Bib the Egypt node is based at Bibliotheca Alexandrina and it's focusing on Arabic language texts. One of the stories that they tell about OCR um, is that what, what they found was they were trying to improve their OCR quality. In the end, it turned out it was the page cleaning software that they were using that was the problem. So the page cleaning software was, was looking over the pages and it was taking all the dots out, viewing the dots. <laughs> Um, as just dirt on the page and so completely changing uh, the meaning of the words on the page. So once they kept the page a bit messier, the OCR actually, the OCR quality actually, um, actually got better. BHL is also trying to increase its audience and reach out to other non-science uh, potential users. Uh, so we think that, uh, you know, BHL has reached the however many static number of taxonomists there are in the world and, um, and now uh, it would be great if other people started to use it. So there's a very active program for making images, taking the images out of the historic texts and making them available for free for artists, illustrators, scientists, educators, whoever wants to use them uh, on Flickr. And I'd suggest going and having a look in the, in the Flickr site because the, the number of images and the variety is just extraordinary. Uh, BHL also maintains a very active presence on social media um, and uh, has also has a very active blog um, and has really interesting things like uh, blogging about um, uh, most recently sea monsters called Releasing the Krakens. More recently BHL's also started to look at um, archival material, um, we could call it grey material, we could call it archival material, such as scanned copies of primary archives such as correspondence and scientific field notes. So they're now starting to go into BHL as well. The big difficulty with handwritten material is that OCRs are of absolutely no help to you. So the BHL, like a number of other services around, around the place, um, is using the sourcing help from volunteers uh, to try and unlock those records. So they're putting up uh, material into projects like this one, the Digivolt project in Australia, which is run by the Atlas of Living Australia and the Australian Museum, um, and, and sourcing uh, transcriptions. Um, our museum is also doing the same and has started to experiment with uploading some field guides out of our collection. Um, and, and a third project that uh, the uh, BHL is also doing is looking at OCR correction and how you might be able to source volunteers to help with that um, and in fact gamify it and, as well. So I've mentioned the Atlas of Living Australia a few times. So BHL in Australia is the literature service for Atlas of, the Atlas of Living Australia. Uh, and the Atlas's aim is, to do, is also to develop an authoritative, freely accessible, distributed, federated biodiversity management system. Within the Atlas, there's a page for every species. Um, 
And within that page, you get photographs, descriptions, maps of museum specimen occurrences, names and classifications, sound files. Um, soon we'll be getting including genetic sequences and as part of the species profile, we also have literature. So on the literature tab, we find the name references found in the Biodiversity Heritage Library and links through to the BHL. And to add in the local content, uh, we also uh, reference and use uh, Trove, which, is, which Amanda also talked about, uh, the National Library of Australia's um, uh, aggregator. So we use the Trove API to bring back matches into the Atlas of Living Australia. Species names have a very um, uh, frustrating habit of changing, or the species names don't change, the taxonomists change their mind about species names. And so we've also written some uh, tricky matching in there. So for example, the red kangaroo, which you would think wouldn't change its name very much over time, but in fact has changed its name a number of times over, over the many years. Uh, so what we do is to uh, actually look for all of those different species names when we send out a server, send out a call to BHL. Um, thinking back to the BHL website where you had all those names listed. The names, uh, synonymising those names um, gets very, very complex, so what we try to do is just bring back matches to absolutely everything we can find. So BHL in, in Australia um, provides a digital literature service for the Atlas, as I've described. We also do the new scanning projects as I've, as I've described as well. And we are, are active partners in the global partnership. We've just started a new project over in, in Australia. And one of the major aims of that project is to assist other institutions who want to start doing their own BHL project. And we'd really like to extend the collaboration both within Australia and if New Zealand would like to, and, and we've had a number of inquiries from uh, institutions in New Zealand who've, who've talked about the desire to perhaps get a BHL node up in New Zealand. Um, we, wouldn't, we would not at all presume to say that we would do something for you, but, we would, but what we would like to extend would be the offer of providing you uh, any assistance that we could uh, if if libraries within New Zealand wanted to band together or even go separately and start a BHL node over here. And I think it would be, there must be an, an awful lot of valuable scientific literature over here. I did a quick search in, in the existing Biodiversity Heritage Library and, and what, what we find for New Zealand and what we find is what we found when we started the Australian project which is there's already a lot of content in there relating to New Zealand. Um, this is because uh, the project when it started was done by 15 really big libraries uh, over in the US mainly, and they just scanned everything. They weren't, uh, to the extent that copyright would allow them to, they just um, scanned whatever was on their shelves. So there's Australian literature, there's literature from countries all around the world, including a, number, a lot of content um, from within New Zealand. So there's a good base to already start from. And that, I think, uh, I think with that, with that offer of um, please come and talk to me if you think there might be any opportunities um, and uh, we'd, be, we'd be really, really happy to start a discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ali. So we have a, we have a bit of time for questions. Does anyone want to hear? Um, you mentioned that you contributed 74 titles. I presume there's some international master list that, that dishes out who's doing which titles and you put your hand up to do different ones. But how does that coordination and prioritisation work? <laughs> um, one would hope that there was a master list. The Europeans were working on a master list until Europeana funding ran out. Um, and so now the master list has kind of gone by the wayside a little bit. Um, we got a, we did actually get a BHL Australia list up and running, a bid list up and running, but then we found that we didn't actually have enough institutions who were bidding. So that's also fallen out of, out of use. Um, now it kind of comes down to uh, if there's a title that we want to have on, you look to see if it's already there, and many times it is. Um, Particularly if, particularly if it's serials, um, less so for monographs. Uh, and then uh, we talk to, it's sort of the, the US team is now 
kind of managing the managing the master list. Um, the there's not so much scanning being done in Europe now. They're still kind of working on how to actually make the aggregator work and how to make it work with Europeana. Um, so the main scanning is still being done in the US um, and and then uh, the specific language scanning being done in in, um, uh, in other countries. So it's Africa, Africa Australia um, and the US who are doing English language scanning. So between the three of us talking is kind of how the bid list operates so at the still, moment. Still there's that discussion, because I mean clearly you don't want to be independently planning to do the same. That's right. Body. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Do you want perhaps? Oh, <laughs> Do you have your uh, own platform in Australia, or you're using the American one and uploading everything? So, how many different actual separate platforms are there? Separate platform. Um, so the so what ended up happening was that Australia built our own website and our own platform. Um, the uh, the Atlas of Living Australia ran out of money at one stage, so couldn't fund satellite projects. Um, We'd also, ever, when we put up the Australian platform, the US team got a bit of platform envy and all said, oh, this is so nice, it's so nicely designed. So now the, so what you, so one of the last things we did before the funding ran out was to merge the, the US and the, the US and the Australian platforms. So the design of the, of the website that you see is that actually the design of the Australian platform um, now placed on top of the US um, system. So. In terms of how many platforms there are, um, Africa, uh, Europe, um, the US and Australia all contribute into the central, um, the central platform. Uh, Brazil maintains its, own, maintains its own, Egypt maintains its own, uh, China maintains its own, and Singapore's only just starting, so I'm not quite sure what decision they're going to make. Um, what we are trying to do is encourage people to even if they've got their own platform, make, make sure that the content's available in both places um, so that people don't have to understand quite so much that, oh, if you want this particular journal, you've got to go to this one, and if you want this one, you've got to go over here. Mm. Yeah. So no, there's no separate Australian platform any longer. Mm. What information do you have about your users? Like, predominantly it's aimed at a scientific audience, but has it gone wider? Uh, certainly with the Flickr group, it's, mu it's gone much, much wider than that. Um, so now, e ever since they started putting the images out, um, it, what they found is that um, it's really the images that, that a wider group of, a wider audience is really fascinated by. Um, but then that brings in historians as well. So, you know, hist historically how species, so some of the literature that goes back to the kind of 18th and 19th centuries, even just, um, you know, in, in the... The, the era of the Wunderkammer and the era of the gentleman, gentleman naturalist, um, just looking even at the language of how, how things were described back then, I think is quite a rich trove for historians to, to um, mine and research and, and look at. Mm. Yeah. I guess that's it. So please join me in thanking Ellie again. Thank you.